Thanks. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody. Um, I came up with a, a fancy title because they asked me to like a month ago and I didn't know what I would talk about, but really I'll just be talking about the DX DAO uh, in real practical terms after Matan uh, just kind of dove deep into the higher level uh, uh, design of competition versus uh, coordination. I'll keep it uh, practical and we'll look at what a, what a DAO, uh, how this one's been operating. So first a little bit of background, just so this makes sense. Um, so I work with Loopring. Loopring is a protocol for building non-custodial, high performance, order book based exchanges. I use all those words instead of calling it a DEX protocol because we've come a long way in, in the space to just uh, bucket everything as a DEX. Uh, you know, we don't concern ourselves with like swaps and stuff. We try to build order book based exchanges. And um, I do uh, business stuff for, for Loopring. So that's the background. And just, just so you can understand a, a bit of what we do and a tiny little shill here, just so this makes sense why we're interested in the DX DAO, uh, we've been using snarks for the past year to increase our scalability from an old version of, of three transactions per second to now 350 in, in the safest terms or several thousand if we relax some, uh, some security guarantees. So how does this relate to the DX DAO? Um, and what is the DX DAO? So, the DXDAO is a next generation decentralized autonomous organization for community governance of software protocols. So it's a DAO for community governance of software protocols. It was created by Gnosis and DAO Stack, um, or it was incepted by them and uh, the code was worked on and, and, and the whole design uh, using DAO Stack's holographic consensus and, and Gnosis figuring out um, the, the more specifics. And most importantly, in my opinion, the DXDAO now owns and governs the Dutch X protocol. Um, and I highlight this, this fact because I find this really cool that this DAO owns a fully working uh, decentralized exchange protocol, uh, the Dutch X protocol. Um, to my knowledge, it's the first DAO that wholly owns uh, a working piece of, of software uh, such as this that actually transacts economic value. So on that note, what is the Dutch X? Uh, it's a Dutch auction trading protocol created by Gnosis. So you see Gnosis had, had a big part in this. Um, and the benefits just very quickly, um, for, you, for you that are familiar with Dutch auctions, some of the, the, the nice properties are it's front running resistant, meaning like there's not race conditions where you could get in gas bidding wars. Uh, I, I won't get into this too much because it, it's a uh, separate topic, but it's front running resistant, which is a big thing for blockchain based Xs. Uh, it could be used as an on chain Oracle for, for fair uh, uh, price feeds. Um, it's good in low liquidity situations, including for initial price discovery where a price has not existed yet. Um, and what we would call uh, slippage resistant here. Um, it's also good because it could be truly decentralized. So it could all live on chain um, and not, you know, succumb to those front running challenges that, that other fully on chain DEXs have. So these are super uh, cool properties. Some of the potential cons or disadvantages are it's slow by design. Auctions take time to clear for everybody. Uh, so a Dutch auction, just to, maybe I should explain it a bit more. The price starts high, it keeps going down, people bid. And eventually when the whole lot that was supposed to be sold, when that's bid up at that last marginal price, the last person that raised their hands, it all clears there. So it's slow. By design, it's meant to take six hours uh, here, but it could take longer or quicker. And it's somewhat complicated for somebody that isn't familiar with trading. It's less easy than maybe an order book or it doesn't have to be. It could be abstracted, but it's a potential uh, disadvantage. So why is it so cool, this marriage of them? Now that the DX DAO owns the Dutch X protocol, in my opinion, it could be or it is the first real, real DEX because you remove that control layer that a, a team, a centralized team usually has. That, you know, people often just think about the architecture of a DEX, what, what's on chain, what's off chain, and, you know, who could censor orders, but they forget about the control layer and like the, the decision making power. Now the, the DX DAO really governs the Dutch X. So that is, the, the, to me, that's the most salient point. And another really cool thing are legal considerations that tons of DEXs face. Uh, when you spin up a DEX and you're making money in some jurisdiction, you have to, you know, you have this regulatory burden. Uh, 
in which jurisdictions could you operate? Could you serve Americans? Could you could you serve securities? By maybe, and I'm not saying this that that the DXDAO does kind of protect us fully, but a lot of work went into the structure that uh, legal considerations could be kept at bay. Also, network effects of uh, DXDAO, which is a network within itself owning a, a trading protocol, you just by design have a bunch of uh, champions for the exchange, right? It's like you own it and um, that's kind of like uh, maybe a, even a primitive in anything crypto is that like we're all part of the network so we all champion it and we all have uh, vested interest. This is like a double case of that. We own the DAO, the DAO owns that. It's the, we could really kind of bootstrap the, the community. So that's why it's, it's important. Um, there's also a few downsides though. Uh, the biggest one in my opinion is potential like apathy. When you have something so decentralized, people are like, they're looking at that guy and that girl to maybe take the lead. It's tough, right? Like people are apathetic or even lazy. Uh, it, it's hard to kind of, um, you know, inertia is, is a thing, right? In decision making. So that's something that we're seeing. Um, lack of action ability or speed of execution. You know, if we all had to decide on a plan right now, it could be a bit more cumbersome than saying you decide. Um, and maybe you're like an expert and, you know, you could just do, do the best. Um, and a final potential downside is like a suboptimal reputation distribution, like who actually has the voting power in the system. Um, if, it, if that initial distribution is out of whack, you could have some problems. So these are the potential downsides. DAO stack and holographic consensus is meant to really, you know, navigate these concerns, um, but they're, they'll persist in, in any decentralized system potentially. Um, and how the DXDAO looks to fight that is you have to balance the sufficient decentralization with the, the provision of meaningful control and the ability to, to actually make decisions. So you want it to be decentralized, but you can't just be, you know, so slow moving. So that's, that's what all this tries to entail. Now, all right, how the heck does Loopring figure into this? Um, as I told you, we're a DEX protocol. And when we saw this happening, we said, wow, community governance of software protocols. We work so hard to make things decentralized, yet it's still like 20 of us, you know, mostly sitting in a room in Shanghai making decisions. We're very cognizant of the fact that eventually we need to let this, you know, be free. The, the software protocol has to be, you know, it has to, we have to let it fly and let the community govern it. So we thought, wow, this is amazing. Someone is doing all the heavy lifting. Um, and we planned for our, our own DAO um, to that same effect. But then we figured the DX DAO could help govern our DAO or vice versa. Like we could give our stake to our DAO, which then controls the DX DAO. So all sorts of cross DAO pollination. Um, also on a kind of practical matter, we actually had an internal need for the Dutch X. That's why I was so interested in it personally years ago or a year ago, um, because there's a little mechanism where within Loopring, we actually had to um, convert a whole grab bag of tokens that are paid in fees to DEXs. We had a mechanism that we needed to turn it into LRC and the Dutch X is good for that, for like discrete interval, low liquidity conversions, right? You can't trade like mat coin for LRC on an order book somewhere. There's just no liquidity. Dutch X is good for that. Um, and I, I thought it was really cool. So I kind of just pushed the team, hey, let's look into this. And, uh, and we did. So initial reputation offering. How do we kind of seed the votes in this, in this community? Um, Gnosis and uh, DAOStack came up with this uh, mechanism to, to distribute the initial reputation. Um, so there was four, let's ignore the 2% storytellers for right now. There was four real methods. You could lock ERC20 tokens, certain ones that were whitelisted. You could lock ETH. Um, you, you lock it for a month and you would get like your proportional share of reputation. You could register MGN. MGN very quickly is a token that's earned by people that trade on the Dutch X. Uh, you trade on the Dutch X, you earn these tokens. You see that's the biggest chunk. And finally, bid gen. DAO stacks a native token, you could bid for reputation. So you see four different methods. The, the design goal for them, speaking for them, was to kind of get a few disparate groups involved and groups that actually have, um, whoops, sorry. Uh, acquired by four different methods during three days, target groups that actually have a technical or legal knowledge and could contribute something. Um, and they, they tried to really uh, kind of optimize for that. And the best slide I could think of to show this was 
was this from the other day. And yes, it's a slide of a slide, but uh, this was um, <laughs> the two uh, creators of this at Dow Stack the other day, and they're showing um, why each like avenue for participation was selected. So we see registering Magnolia. That was for 50% of the voting power. Strong Dutch X coupling. You want people that understand the, D the DX DAO's main asset, the Dutch X. Who are those? Those are the market makers. So you give the power to them. Um, and 70 participants came in registering their Magnolia that they earned on the Dutch X. Next, locking ERC-20 tokens. That's to include projects like Loopring who have their communities, who may have an internal need for the Dutch X or, uh, or an eventual need for the DXDAO governance structure, but to get other, you know, it's like let others uh, help you towards your goal. And you see 25 different tokens were locked. That's how we participated, you'll see in a second. Locking ETH was very nice. That's for ease, ease, of, ease of use. You know, presumably a lot of people that care about this stuff have ETH, let them lock it to reserve their, their, their voting power. And finally, bidding gen. This was to actually fund the DAO. So you bid with DAO Stacks token for reputation, and that's how you earn it. Now the DAO has a starting treasury of, of gen. So there you have it, why the initial reputation, one of the most you know, important uh, features, how it, it came about. Um, and here were the stats. Um, the most important one is just 399 participants. You see that 28 were smart contracts using like the Gnosis safe, just for ease of transferability later and configurability. 20 million bucks almost were locked in there. But yeah, almost 400 people participated. Let's look quickly how they did. So you see 30,000 ETH were locked up eventually and the number of participants per method, you had mainly the ETH and the token lockers, right? Magnolia is like, it's just, it's for the traders on the Dutch X and the gen bidders were, were, the, were the two lower ones. Um, now here's where I'll say, okay, Loopring participated on the locking of the tokens. But remember, on day one of 30, we had no clue how much reputation other people, like each track, let me just say quickly, it's like you compete with other people in that track. So for the token uh, reputation distribution, how much I stake is measured versus how much other people stake of tokens. Nothing to do with bidding gen or bidding ETH. Um, I earn 30%, which is allotted to that avenue. I earn it uh, relative to other people in that avenue. So loopering, so I was going to do it personally. Then I told you know our, our founder and CEO, hey, this is cool. Let's get involved. And he went big, okay? <laughs> That's us in pink. Um, of course, he didn't know what big was beforehand. He did it on day one. First of all, so that was actually a few million bucks of LRC. So he's a, 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 a risk taker just to lock that up in a smart contract that uh, could potentially have a, have a bug. But you know, we didn't know if actually other people would dwarf us and we could have ended up with 2%. We had no idea what people would stake. It was non-deterministic at the beginning. However, you see in the ERC-20 staking method, we earned 43%. That is not the whole uh, of four methods though, keep in mind. So it really would be 30% times that. And this is actually what we ended up with in the, uh, so slightly off now because a, a bit more is minted, but we ended up with 10.5% of the DX DAO reputation, the biggest chunk. And you see the rest, uh, how, how it comes to play. Greater than 50%, uh, you need seven people own 50% of the vote. So you see kind of uh, the, for, you see how it's distributed there. We, we ended up with 10.5%. So now let's go into what has the DX DAO been up to after this, uh, this, by the way, this happened in June. Uh, the reputation distribution happened in June. What has the DX DAO been up to? So one of the first proposals, Slashing loopering reputation, all right? Those uh, son of a guns. But actually, um, but really, um, so you see this is a proposal, but it was voted down. So thanks everybody that voted it down. But really, this wasn't like an adversarial, hey, loopering, get out of here. It was actually us that said, oh, we ended up with a lot. We want to flatten this distribution. It was actually us that said, um, it was me that put forward our first unofficial proposal, because a proposal is a technical thing in DAO stack where you propose it, it becomes actionable and voted upon. Just in a forum, I said, hey, we want to give away 0.5%. We either want to donate it or distribute it or auction it, sell it for ETH, let's say, which will go into the treasury. So we wanted to do that. So that was actually a friendly proposal that someone did that. Um, here's the motivations I said. But actually, it was harder than anticipated. And to date, we have not given that 0.5%. And it was harder than anticipated briefly because 
one little technical thing was, we don't know. Let's say I were to give it to that guy, who's a good, uh, a, a nice DAO contributor. I don't know if he has like four other identities that hold two, six, and four percent of the DAO, and now he actually becomes a bigger shareholder than Loopring, right? You have this pseudonymity civil attack problem. Um, uh, price discovery. If we did in fact want to sell it, what's a fair price? Half a percent for one ETH, ten ETH. Um, like anecdotally, when I put that on Twitter, Amin from Malakdao said, I'll buy it, but like what price? And he was probably kidding anyway. But um, And then there's like technical reasons, like how do you actually do it? They're all super solvable and somewhat trivial, but it's not like just a sell button. You have to do it. Um, oh yeah, what I should say is reputation is not a token. It's non-transferable. The only way to transfer it is to make a proposal, which would vote upon it, and then it would slash me and mint it for somebody else. So. Um, so that's that's what happened. Let's just see what else uh, we've been up to in, in the DX DAO. Um, I say here, finding out our culture and molding the reputation distribution. Here we have uh, Eric, like a, a big contributor. Um, he says, so we had our first weekly call a couple weeks ago, and you know we want to reward people. So he says, to kind of get this culture going, let's reward each person that that went on the call with 0.1 percent rep each. And keep in mind, if if the 12 of us that were on the call, with, if we earn 0.1% rep each, everybody else gets relatively diluted. Um, so actually, after he proposed this, informally, we said, you know what, Like, we don't think that's a good mechanism because maybe it's slightly against the social contract. People weren't aware. Time zones aren't fair. And then you could, it's kind of game, it's gameable. You'll have people that log on to the weekly call, mask their uh, their computer, go on mute, and, you know, buzz off and just earn... Uh, uh, reputation like that. So, but, you know, we're trying to figure out ways to like, hey, you're a valuable member of the DAO. Let's give you reputation and all the while uh, dilute everybody else. Um, what else we've been up to? Very cool. Uh, claiming ENS domains. So, sorry, one thing first is remember, the Dutch X has the potential to be the most decentralized DEX, in my opinion, because that governance layer is decentralized. We need the ability to put the interfaces for everyday users to interact with the Dutch X protocol, our main asset, we need to put that up on kind of censorship resistant, unkillable uh, mediums. So we wanted to buy ENS domains. And here we have uh, uh, a, a little Twitter snippet saying, hey, we bought um, dxdao.eth, which we had to navigate in certain ways. We also bought, and here's an actual proposal, we also bought dutchx.eth. So now we could spin up an alternative interface to the two that already exist, which are central, you know, that are uh, subject to whatever regulatory regime they live in. Now we could put it on Ethereum, host it on IPFS, and literally have an unkillable exchange at the architecture level and at the governance layer. So now we own DutchX.eth. Pretty cool. Another asset for us. And you see nice participation there, 25%, all votes for. What else we've been doing? We've been whitelisting and de-whitelisting tokens. I'll go over this quickly. Like whitelisting tokens means it's eligible to earn Magnolia on the, when you trade, you earn Magnolia. So it's kind of like preferred tokens on a service. Here we accepted, um, or, you know, we're, we're going to accept, there's like some consensus behind uh, whitelisting hot holo token because we think that they have a good token that lends itself, not a good token, but that their community wants the Dutch X. Um, and, like, so we want to get people to, to come to, to venues where their community is like leading the way. Similarly, we de, -white, we de white listed tokens because we don't want just any random token to be on there. We want to kind of control uh, our preferred service. So whitelisting and de -white, white listing. Then we're also making good on some of our initial promises. Remember I showed you at the beginning, there was 2% for DAO storytellers of reputation distribution. That was like a suggestion. Hey, people that help tell the story of the DX DAO, let's reward them. Here, we have somebody that said, hey, uh, I listed a whole bunch of tweets, check it out. I'm requesting some of that reputation that like we had a social contract around that you'll reward me. And indeed, we voted we voted for, um, and he's gonna get like 0.29% reputation. So, you know, it's, it's just all such a, a nice experiment, really. Um, what else have we been up to? We actually had our first in-person meeting two mornings ago. Uh, so that's really cool to after months of telegram chat and DAO talk form chat, we had our, our meeting. Um, some of them are in the house right now. We even have like the most perfect photo bomber ever. Um, it's so crazy. <laughs> what? Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, you'll see. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. Look at his wife or friend is even laughing like perfectly. Um, we had our first in-person meeting. We have a potential uh, logo coming out. Um, here it is. Um, DXD. That's up for a proposal right now. Right now, people like it. For some reason, when the when the Gnosis um, uh, people spoke about this the other day, they said legal disclaimer. This is not our official. Logo. So I'm just saying the same thing in case somebody. <laughs> I don't know why, but like, yeah, that's that's not mine or the I don't know, like legal gray areas. Um, um, we have a bit of money, so from that gen auction, we have a couple hundred thousand gen, which is worth seventeen thousand bucks. So that is our treasury in real dollars, dollar equivalents. We could also fund ourselves by selling more reputation or DXD tokens, which we could mint that has some right. Maybe the DXD gives you preferential treatment on the Dutch X. Maybe you stake it to earn reputation. It's up to us. It's a green field, um, but we could fund ourselves through a bunch of different ways. Um, moving on, here's just a little look. This is what making a proposal looks like on the interface, the alchemy interface from DowStack. Your, your title, your description, and then what you want in reputation rewards or in the potential DXD token or in ETH. Let's say you say, hey, I'm gonna go evangelize the DX, the DX DAO on some campus. I need two ETH to to drive there and set up a booth, et cetera. A big thing is focusing attention. That's kind of like what Dow Stack really allows for at scale is like, okay, there's gonna be a thousand proposals a week eventually in the DX DAO. How do you kind of put the best ones to the top? That's why you have these boosted proposals and you see there's nothing impending and there's like regular even below. But you see people cared about the DX DAO branding, so they upstaked it. I won't get into that, I'm sorry, I don't have time, but. That's what this is all about, is like focusing the very scarce resource of attention. Um, now, a bit back to LoopRing, what we plan to do with it. So LEAF, the LoopRing Ecosystem Advancement Fund, that's where we stake those tokens from. That is our community fund, um, which is filled with our, our native token, LRC. So we said, hey, we have this, right now it's not being used, let's stake it, and hopefully this will be a very valuable asset for LRC holders, who we eventually want to kind of bequeath uh, control to. Um, so it's really, it's so interesting. Like here I am a loop ringer, but I'm doing the work of like the Dutch X, which I own or like the community of loop ring owns. I mean, uh, so it's just really nice, like cross pollination. And it's a strong start for our eventual DAO. Like I can't wait for the day when, Hey, here's the loop ring DAO, which now owns the DX DAO stake or conversely, the DX DAO governs the loop ring DAO or, and potentially the loop ring protocol. Um, so that's what we're doing. Now this is kind of a tangent, but I just find it relevant. Like you might read these days how we've moved from the information age to the reputation age. Um, it's just no coincidence that like the voting power is called reputation in, um, in uh, DAO stack, in my opinion. Information, I believe, and many believe, will only have value once it's been filtered because there's such an abundance of information. I can't possibly navigate it all. I need to like look to others who navigate it, uh, uh, who kind of filter it. And I say, oh, he, it's like, you know, I don't evaluate every EIP or, you know, the feasibility of sharding. I say, oh, really smart people in the Ethereum community like it, I'm for it, right? Like that's, that, that's how a lot of this is working. And something that's very interesting, this allows for anonymous or pseudonymous participation in the DXDAO. Only some members, large members have stepped forward, put their, their face on it. But Loopring, because we staked so much, they knew it was Loopring. So here we have actually uh, a situation where, sure, we have some outsized control right now or a little bit, but we're actually very aware of like the social pressures of like acting in the benefit of the DAO. Um, we have to kind of, you know, gain the respect. Otherwise, actually everybody could say, okay, actually Loopring is being, an, you know, not a great steward. Let's fork it and just, we'll d distribute their DAO. Um, and I just really like this quote um, it's from uh, a psychologist, I think, Philip Roche. I, I read it a, a while ago, but what most clearly sets human beings apart from other species is the internalized gaze of others that permanently haunts us. That's a bit uh, maybe on, on, on the morbid side, but it means uh, <laughs> like, you know, that is, it's kind of interesting. What makes us human beings, like when I met up with the DX DAO for the first time, I'm very aware that like, okay, we have this power, but we want to cooperate. We want to be loved. Uh, and we're very aware of that internalized gaze of others. Um, now the final thing I'll say here, the DX DAO must define its mission, not because that's like a cool thing to say, but in the framework of DAO stack, predictors that stake gen are literally predicting what the DAO will vote for. 
and not necessarily what is good for it. If like, you know, it's like several layers of like abstraction of I think that they'll vote for that because that, so we actually must have a very well-defined mission so people could properly upstake what we care about. If people don't know our intentions, it's, it's kind of a useless framework. The success of the DAO at scale comes down to us having a reputation among predictors, the global networks of gen stakers, that they know what we care about so they could feed us what's important. Um, and finally, DXDAO call to action, auction, haha. <laughs> um, figure out how to fund this thing sustainably, which we do have several um, informal proposals and potentially some, some real proposals coming up, selling reputation, selling DXD. Figure out how to drive DutchX volumes, the DXDAO's greatest asset, and to me, the only uh, DAO owned um, uh, protocol right now. How do we drive DutchX volumes? Those are actually very tightly coupled. If we drive DutchX volumes, we could, the DXDAO could earn fees from those DutchX volumes, and then we don't have to sell a token, perhaps. We're just earning fees. We're going to be a money making DAO. Um, but how do we actually drive DutchX volumes? Just a little uh, technical note here or uh, practical note. We say, okay, where do people really want the Dutch X? And remember, it's slippage resistant. So for super deep popular liquid pairs like ETH DAI, if someone wants to sell 10 million of that, the Dutch X is a good venue to do that. On an order book or Uniswap, you can't really escape the slippage. On the other extreme, you have super niche, new, venueless tokens. Maybe they're regulatory gray area, so a centralized exchange won't list it, or maybe there's just not a lot of community power, some random token. If I issue a token, but I have a nice group of uh, followers, I could list it on the Dutch X, which is list, which has an interface on IPFS and ENS. And um, so kind of those are the way I see it, the two big extremes of, of where the Dutch X could find market fit. And uh, finally, like all DAOs need a, a meme. And my proposal, as uh, you alluded to, is I want this guy to be, uh, to, uh, <laughs> to be the face of it and uh that's it thank you uh, yeah hello uh thank you very was very interesting um uh, so as soon as the dex actually get a trade protocol actually uh you need to create liquidity for each pair so do you have some model to interact like with for example for, with other DAOs that can provide liquidity stake liquidity in your pairs and actually be incentivized with the, with the fees, uh, like a, be a market maker for, for your protocol? Right, yeah, that's like one of the most important questions. One of the largest reputation holders, or, or a few of them, are people that were the largest market makers in that vote staking period. So they know the technicalities of why it was market maker friendly, why it wasn't. So we're really actually looking to this reputation holder saying, what can we do to attract market makers, but yes, that's exactly what we want to do. That's actually what the Magnolia token that uh, Gnosis implemented is meant for. When you trade a lot on the Dutch X, you earn this MGN. If you have MGN, you don't have to give as much as a liquidity contribution to the next auction. It's not a fee. There's no value actually being extracted. But when a normal trader trades on the Dutch X, there's a 0.5% liquidity contribution fee. That's kind of getting seeding the ne next auction. If a very active market maker has a lot of MGN, they don't have to give that liquidity contribution. So there already are in place some mechanics to incentivize market makers, but we actually want to take, we want the, the DX DAO to earn fees of the Dutch X. We want to change that parameter, make maybe a 0.1% trading fee to come to the DX DAO so we could have market makers own the Dutch X and the DX DAO and earn those fees the most. And um, if you're a market, if you have ideas about that, then I'm def we're definitely keen. How how many Dutch X uh, reputation holders are in here? Yeah, a, a lot. Yeah. Oh, so there's a couple of guys at the back. So I, I'm doing like a decentralized hackathon, and, and I'm and I'm thinking of requesting the Dutch X to fund some of the decentralized hackathon that's happening later this week at ETH Berlin. So no, it, it, hey, hey, it's like two thousand, maybe four thousand dollars, and this could tie in uh, very well to, um, I guess, uh, your marketing efforts and trying to get people to know about the DXDAO and trade on the DXDAO. Yeah. Yeah.